Separation is difficult, especially when you're a child and another city might as well be another country. If your best friend moves to another city, it's not like you can just jump in your car and see her. More so 20 years ago before text messaging and video chat. You had to write letters if you wanted to stay in touch. And there was only one phone per house, so you were relegated to an hour of phone time a week with your best friend. This is the future of Stacy and Claudia in the Babysitter's Club number 13. Goodbye, Stacy. Goodbye. Why Anne and Martin decided to separate the girls only to have Stacy return is beyond me. But this book is nevertheless sad and bittersweet. Charlotte genuinely moved me in this book. But there's some weird shit in this one. This is Rereading My Childhood, The Babysitter's Club number 13. Goodbye, Stacy. Goodbye. Stacy's books usually start with food. In this one, she's having a dream reminiscent of Homer Simpson's imagined land of chocolate. There are three Stacy characteristics. She likes math, she likes boys, and she has diabetes. This book starts with her Tootsie Roll craving. It eventually goes into the usual describing of the BSC members, complete with the need to tell us that Claudia is Japanese and that she and Stacy are more sophisticated than Christy and Marianne. The important early complication occurs during a family dinner where her parents have some news. All right, Dad went on. This is the truth. Do you remember when my company opened a branch in Stamford? Yes, I replied right before we moved here. Dad nodded. Well, the new branch isn't doing well at all. The company decided to get rid of it. Oh no, you lost your job, I cried. Frantically, I began to calculate how much money I had saved from babysitting jobs and how far it could be stretched. Not quite, said Dad. They're combining the Stamford branch with the Boston branch and I'm being transferred back to New York. Stacy tells Claudia that her family is moving back to New York, so the girls have an impromptu sleepover. They come up with what they think is a great idea. Stacy can move into the Kishi household, taking the spare bedroom, allowing Stacy to stay in Stony Brook. Stacy's parents object to the idea. They need to watch Stacy's food intake and they would miss her. Claudia's parents don't want to be responsible for someone with diabetes. Cool thinking, Mr. and Mrs. Kishi. The next day, Stacy calls an emergency meeting of the BSC to announce that her family is moving. If we hadn't been sitting smack in the center of the Stony Brook Middle School cafeteria, I'm sure all five of us would have started wailing away. As it was, we were pretty close. Marianne, who cries easily, picked up her napkin and kept touching it to the corners of her eyes. Dawn put her fork down and began swallowing hard. Christy, who rarely cries, bit her lip and stared out the window. I didn't do anything except not look at Claudia, but even so, I knew she wasn't looking at me too. After a moment, I said, your enthusiasm is underwhelming. That brought a few smiles, at least. I laughed. I thought it was kind of funny. The BSC spent some time reminiscing about things that happened in previous books, like when Marianne and Stacy took the Pike kids to miniature golf, when Charlotte and Stacy were scared by Charlotte's dog, and when Stacy took Christie's cousins to the movies. Riveting stuff. I'm being a little reductive, but that is essentially what they remembered. When Stacy leaves, the rest of the BSC plan to have a going away party for Stacy. However, they don't have enough money to throw a good party. They need to get to a babysitting if they want to have enough money to throw Stacy an early 90s style teen party. Luckily, Stacy gives them a solution. Apparently, the McGills have accumulated a house full of stuff they don't need, just like real upper middle class suburbanites. They can't take all their crap with them to New York City, so Mrs. McGill lets the BSC sell stuff at a yard sale and they're allowed to keep any money they receive. Good, that plot complication is done and dealt with, long before it could be interesting. Meanwhile, over at the Pike's house, the Pike children, minus Mallory, are playing spies with Jordan as J. Edgar Hoover in this mini CIA. They have new neighbors, the Congdons, and the Pike children believe those outsiders are up to something. The Pike parents didn't instill a sense of welcoming to outsiders in their children, did they? Just like proper upper middle class suburbanites who may or may not be involved with the mob. Let's get back to the 16 Candle style teen rager the BSC is planning for their boy crazy friend. They come up with flyers with catchy rhymes to advertise the yard sale. They rummage through mounds of crap to price things. We learn that Dawn doesn't know what to price things because, as she says, quote, people in California don't have yard sales. No, Dawn, or should I say actual writer Anne and Martin who clearly grew up on the East Coast, people in California do have yard sales. They're just filled with surfboards, hacky sacks, and they're all celebrities, so their stuff is autographed. There's a side plot with Morbida, Destiny, and Karen and a bunch of neighborhood kids. Morbida gives them lemonade and is perfectly nice. Ugh, not interested. Moving on. Need to get to kid and play and house party. 
Stacy babysits for Charlotte, her favorite charge. We get this heartbreaking scene. I have to tell you something, Charlotte. We're moving again. Charlotte wrenched her neck around and peered at me. What? We're moving back to New York in a couple weeks. You mean you're leaving Stony Brook? You're leaving me? I nodded. I watched Charlotte take in the awful information. She looked like she had just swallowed a horrible medicine. Iggy's house dropped to the floor as Charlotte put her head in her hands and began to cry. I'm really sorry, Char, I said. I don't want to go, but my dad's job is changing. We have to move. I wrapped my arms around Charlotte and she let me hold her for several moments. Then suddenly she leaped up and started shouting. I hate you, she cried. I hate you. You're mean. I thought you liked babysitting for me. Fucking harsh. But I have to remember that this is the 90s. There was no video chat. There was no texting. If you wanted to call long distance, you had to have a calling card and it cost a dollar a minute. Now the only people who call me are the helpful employees of Visa MasterCard who just want to lower my credit card rates and all I have to do is give them my credit card number, my name, the number on the back, my social security number, the hospital where I was born, my mother's maiden name, my father's first girlfriend, my grandmother's favorite cigarette type, and the first name of the third friend I made in third grade, my sister's license plate number, my thoughts on Sioux Falls, and my partner's DNA. Getting back to Charlotte and Stacy. Their only hope is to become pen pals, and that's impossible to maintain. Name a pen pal that you've had for longer than a year. Go ahead. I'll wait. Cool. You thought of one? Now think of another. Yeah, I thought so. And Charlotte would have to compete with Claudia. Who would you rather receive letters from? An eight-year-old with a shy streak or a crazy judgmental person who was on the brink of murdering her family and painting her walls with their blood? That went dark, but you can see it. Her family would die, but on the bright side, they would be a part of some beautiful art, especially when compared to the shit that other murderers have created. That's right, Gacy. I'm calling you out. There's a bunch of yard sale shenanigans, including a scene involving Christy and the Barretts attempting to sell their stuff on their own. They don't sell anything and, instead, show up to Stacy's yard sale and sell their wares. And speaking of Stacy's yard sale, the BSC has one. People show up. Charlotte and Stacy make up. It's successful. Now we can get on with the plot. What kind of party is the BSC going to throw their favorite boy crazy sitter? A rager on the levels of 16 candles complete with problematic Asian character falling out of a tree? How about the toga party in Animal House? This is Stacy after all, and they did make a ton of money at the yard sale. They have to go all out. Maybe it will be on the levels of the house party movie of my childhood. Can't hardly wait. Come on, BSC. It has to have boys, and lots of them. The guests were not who I expected at all. Claudia, Marianne, Don, Logan, and Shannon were there. But the other guests were children. All the kids, except for the babies, that our club sits for. As I looked slowly around at the grinning faces, I saw the eight Pikes. Mallory, Byron, Jordan, Adam, Vanessa, Nikki, Margot, and Claire. Jamie Newton. Mariah and Gabby Perkins, Charlotte Johansson, Buddy and Susie Barrett, Don's brother Jeff, Christy's brother David Michael, Karen and Andrew, Nina and Eleanor Marshall, Jackie Shea and Archie Radowski, Hanny and Lenny Papadakis, Amanda and Max Delaney, and even Jenny Prezioso. I guess they couldn't really leave her out. Okay, so a couple of things. First, it's not really a teenage party, is it? You'd think boy crazy Stacy would want to have a party with, you know, boys. Secondly, I am glad they left out the babies, I guess. Third, she just spun around and counted the children who were there as they're grinning. If this were any other novel, the grinning would be menacing and they were planning to kill her and eat her. Lastly, shade on Jenny Prezioso. Don't throw shade on children, especially one that's at the mercy of her overbearing mother. There's a cake for everyone and a smaller sugar-free cake for Stacy, which I'm sure tastes exactly the same as the real cake. It also features a giant drawing of everyone's houses. Cool. So Stacy has to get rid of a bunch of stuff because she's moving into a small apartment in New York City and the BSC thinks it's a good idea to give her a giant drawing that she has to take with her and hang somewhere in her limited space. Good thinking, BSC. I can see why you're so successful. Claudia outfit alert. She was wearing a wonderful Claudia outfit, a purple and white striped bodysuit under a gray jumper thing. The legs of the bodysuit stretched all the way to her ankles and she was wearing purple push-down socks anyway. Around her middle was a wide purple belt with a buckle in the shape of a telephone and on her feet were black ballet slippers. I found my Halloween outfit. The big day comes and Stacy has to leave but not before a final goodbye from the BSE. 
Stacy also gives them business cards with her new address and phone number, JK58761, and the words, the New York branch of the Babysitter's Club. Since I know that Stacy returns to Stony Brook, that JK in her phone number seems like foreshadowing, but this book was written in 1988. And according to a brief letter in the back of the new books, Anne and Martin intended for Stacy to stay in New York. This book was fine. I felt for Charlotte, but I couldn't read this book without the knowledge that Stacy returns. I also feel like the children should have said goodbye during the yard sale and a party closer to the one at the end of Logan Likes Marianne would be more appropriate for Stacy, one with classmates in music and dancing. And the giant picture is just not a good gift for someone trying to get rid of things. The whole book is about her trying to get rid of things. Why gift her more things? <laughs> 